Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. All right, welcome to Freestyle Friday, where I get to do what I want. I'm back with more Freestyle Friday videos. The last couple of weeks, we talked about wine pricing. And then I had the episode this past Monday where I compared six cabs from Cali. For the next couple months, I'm going to be tackling a variety of subjects in the wine world related to how wine is made. A kind of how the sausage is made concept. The idea is to give you real factual information about where your wine comes from and how it is made. This has been inspired by the rise of several companies touting healthier, cleaner, or natural wines. I wouldn't call this especially advanced level stuff, but these videos might be 15 to 30 minutes uh, in length rather than my target of 10 minutes for most of my videos on WWTV. However, this one, being a quick overview, should be pretty short. We'll see. It's kind of a sneaky, sneaky way of doing some higher level educational videos that will complement my upcoming Psalm School Advanced channel, but hopefully appeal to a more consumer audience. There are a ton of ways to approach this broad subject. I've been contemplating how I want to do this and what topics to cover for quite a few months. Much of this is also fueled by the questions and misconceptions my customers have at the day job. If they have these, then the general population has them too. So let's start clarifying both where our wine comes from and how it is made. Just a quick aside, much of this information comes from Wikipedia and other sources. For all of these videos, I've amassed a lot of source material online. I've created a PDF with all the links because if I try to post it on YouTube, I'll probably exceed the character limit, the character limit for video descriptions. Now this is each video will have its own PDF file. Now I'm not going to have like a, that's actually what I should do is just have a master PDF file for all of the links I'm using. But the way I have it set up right now, it's each video has its own or each subject has its own list of sources. First, wine is an agricultural product. While it may seem magical that we take grape juice and convert it into wine, it's a pretty detailed process. And before we can do anything, well, we need grapes. So let's start with them. Grapes come from a farm. I know we use the term vineyard, but you know, it's at the most basic level, a vineyard is just another name for a farm, a very specific farm, even more specific than an orchard, since that can apply to any tree fruit or tree nut. Here we have a bit of a misunderstanding of just how these grapes are grown and what farming methods are used. Today, I'm gonna to give an overview of a few of the major farming methods and what do they mean for your wine. I'll follow up this video with a more detailed video or two for each farming method. The first thing we need to do is give a very brief history of farming. For thousands of years, we had simple agriculture. Many of the decisions on the farm followed a lunar-based calendar as civilizations developed. It became more organized and yields improved to meet rising populations. With the expansion of civilization also came the idea of different crops being traded or distributed to different parts of the world. This expanded even more after 1492. Beginning around the 16th century, some more modern ideas were becoming the norm. They included the idea of crop rotation. This is a system where you rotate what crops are planted in different sections of the farm. This helps replenish nutrients the previous crop used. Some systems also have a section that will lay fallow or unplanted for a set amount of time. These improvements continued whether it was crop rotation, selective breeding, or mechanization of various tasks on the farm. All of these were also used in vineyards. The 20th century ushered in a new era of farming, starting with gas-powered tractors and synthetic fertilizers. Both of these advances, plus others, helped improve efficiency and yields. 
After World War II, there was a big push for the chemical sides, fungicides, herbicides, pesticides, etc. They were very effective in preventing damage to the crops from various pests and undesirable plants and animals on the farm or vineyard. The 1950s, 60s, and 70s saw this type of intensive or conventional farming dramatically increase. On the surface, it was very beneficial to the increasing population, as in people. Without much of these sides and other advances in farming, we wouldn't have near the amount of food and livestock we have today. Now, don't get me wrong, conventional farming is still the most widely practiced type by a long shot. The rest are still small. Using 2018 numbers, only 5.7% of the vineyards in the world were certified organic. For certified biodynamic, in 2020, the total was 0.3% of total vineyards. So yes, conventionally farmed vineyards make up around 94%, give or take a percent in today's number. Total vineyard acreage has been trending downward, so current numbers may be closer to 93% for conventional farming. So what are the advantages and disadvantages to each of these methods? With conventional farming, you can create consistency with your crops, in our case, grapes. I'll stick to just vineyards at this point, but one more point is that with conventional farming, there is less need for crop rotation and you're able to have a monoculture farm, which can be an advantage to a crop like grapes, depending on your perspective. With conventional farming, the use of synthetic treatments can help protect the vineyard, disease pressure is reduced, pest control is better. You can help ensure that it, in a less than ideal year, you will still have a smaller but viable crop. You can also control the fertility of the soil via fertilizers. Irrigation also allows you to supplement the normal rainfall during the growing season and even grow grapes where they wouldn't normally be able to survive. In this scenario, the very dry conditions give an added benefit of lower disease pressure. So, in essence, you could use less chemicals to control that. Mechanization of the tasks in the vineyard creates higher yields while reducing labor costs. This is especially important for those value wines, those wines under $10 a bottle. This is not exclusive to conventional farming, but it's less common in other types of farming. Overall, conventional farming allows the winery to have more consistency in their crop from year to year. This can be vital for very large operations as any small change can have wide ranging effects to their bottom line. While not every aspect of conventional farming has to be done by the large brands, the fact is that much of this is necessary to be able to profitably deliver that value wine. Plenty of small family operations utilize this style of farming. With these vineyards, the wine growers I've talked to, try to use as little synthetic sides as possible. Ever notice we almost never call them grape growers or farmers? Yeah, I, I don't know why. Because you don't grow a wine, you make a wine. But that's not important right now. All right, so because these industrial wines are using high yielding grapes, they are less expensive for various reasons. They are also sourced from a wide area, so terroir is of little importance. This is partially why most of these wines taste the same every year, regardless of vintage. The issue with this kind of farming is the potential of overusing the chemicals used in the vineyard. Some of these chemicals have a short half-life, so they are no longer present on the grapes at harvest. Depending on the part of the world, the use of chemicals will be regulated such that you won't be able to do it after a certain date or within a certain number of weeks or days of harvest. So as far as the grapes themselves, there is effectively no harmful effects. This is true for most produce farmed this way. Don't get me wrong, there will always be a case somewhere where a company cut it too close with these chemicals before harvest and there may be some residual. I've never heard of it in the case of wine, however. While the grapes themselves may be fine, these chemicals do affect the environment, both in the vineyard and elsewhere via any runoff from rain or being carried by the wind. The continued use of these chemicals can basically leave the soil lifeless, as it's been explained to me by many wine growers and winemakers. The soil becomes more dependent on fertilizers and other products to provide the necessary nutrients. Even so, the normal flora and fauna of the soil, you know, that's the bugs, bacteria, organic material, etc., is lost.
All right, so organic farming is an attempt to farm in a way that is less harmful to the environment. Other countries have their own regulations regarding what constitutes organic, and they have a couple of levels. For the most part, they are similar enough that I can use the USDA's regulations as a guideline. However, in some cases, the U.S. has stricter reg regulations than countries like Canada and then the EU. Here are the first two paragraphs taken from the USDA's Introduction to Organic Practices PDF. Quote, the USDA organic regulations describe organic agriculture as the application of a set of cultural, biological, and mechanical practices that support the cycling of on-farm resources, promote ecological balance, and conserve biodiversity. These include maintaining or enhancing soil and water quality, conserving wetlands, woodlands, and wildlife, and avoiding use of synthetic fertilizers, sewage sludge, irradiation, and genetic engineering. Organic producers use natural processes and materials when developing farming systems. These contribute to the soil, crop and livestock nutrition, pest and weed management, attainment of production goals, and conservation of biological diversity." End quote. For crops and wine specifically, this can mean a lot of different things depending on how much of the wine is considered organic. There are some allowances to use approved non-organic sprays or other products in the vineyard and also additives in the winery. It all depends on the level of organic the winery qualifies for with any specific wine. They can even make completely non-organic wine and organic wine in the same facility. There are rules that govern this in order to not mix non-organic with organic, however. There are a small set of exceptions where a winery can use non-organic materials or procedures. It's not a terribly long list, but it does cover a wide variety of general situations for crops. Most of these are ge generic with a few specifically about grapes. Sulfur addition is one of the exceptions depending on the level of organic the wine is considered to be. In essence, if a winery carries a USDA certified organic seal, then they are basically doing everything right. Biodynamic farming. Now, this has been described to me as organic farming on steroids. In reality, it's organic farming with some additional natural elements. There are some additional natural treatments that they should make on site. They also follow a calendar that gives them instructions on what to do depending on what kind of day it is on the calendar. The moon and astrology can also be part of this. There's a focus on the earth and energy with biodynamic farming. There's also an excellent chance you'll have some extra biodiversity in the vineyard. There are no legal definitions when it comes to biodynamic in any country. Instead, there is an international organization called Demeter, or it might be called Demeter. I've heard both, but we'll go with Demeter, the Greek goddess of the moon and harvest. They will do a full audit of your farming practices to ensure you meet their requirements. All right, regenerative farming. While the concept of regenerative farming has been around for a few decades, it's a new concept to me. I've seen many of the elements of it talked about. A lot of times it's been in conjunction with organic or biodynamic. It focuses on topsoil regeneration, increasing biodiversity, improving the water cycle, enhancing ecosystem services, supporting biosequestration, increasing resilience to climate change, and strengthening the health and vitality of farm soil. So a lot of it sounds like organic and biodynamic. The difference here is the main focus on topsoil regeneration. None of the others specify regeneration of topsoil from what I've read. I'm not saying that it's not mentioned at all, it's just not something that's considered a priority. Like biodynamics, there's no governmental oversight or legal definition. There is at least one certifying body for viticulture, but it's so new that very few wineries have been certified. I've never seen any kind of logo on a wine label either. Actually, I, I've seen a picture of one now. When I wrote this, there hadn't been anything yet. All right, sustainable. So what about sustainable? Typically, this is more than just a farming practice. However, in pretty much every case, to be considered a sustainable winery, you need to be at least practicing organic farming. The rest of it concerns how the winery operates as a business. 
from wages, housing, sustainable business practices, etc. There are both governmental and private organizations in many places that will certify a winery is sustainable. In addition to that, there are other private organizations that have similar certifications. These may focus on specific farming practices or take a broad look at an operation. All of these tend to be regionalized. In the U.S., it may be by state or group of states that gravitate towards these kinds of certifications. When it comes to wine, all of these sustainable certs are really concentrated on the West Coast. In many ways, being a sustainable winery is the ultimate in combining everything that is necessary to operate a vineyard and winery in the most eco-friendly and ethical way. It's recognizing that a winery or a vineyard is a business at the end of the day, but it's not necessarily everything it appears to be as I've discovered in doing all my research on it. Now, let me go back to regenerative farming or regenerative agriculture. Their certification also looks at the winery as a whole. Biodynamic also looks at the winery and the land as a whole, uh, not just the vineyard, but sustainable. It's looking at your business practices. Bio does not. And regenerative also looks at your business practices. It's basically sustainable with the requirement of organic farming. Natural wine. Now, this isn't a farming practice as much as a method of making wine. So the last episode, other than a wrap-up, will be about natural wine. Is this the best wine, or are they just lost hippies? I've had good and bad from this category. I'll break down what it means. So that's your overview as to what the differences are when it comes to farming practices. Each of these also have requirements when it comes to actual winemaking. In theory, you could have a wine made from the barest minimum for organic grapes and still use some elements of what you could call normal uh, modern winemaking or industrial winemaking. You can also be 100% organic and still have modern equipment. You're just restricted in what you can do in the winery. And many of these certifications or practices are wine specific rather than the entire winery. So what we're about to embark on, I, I didn't put this in the script, what we're about to embark on is a pretty in-depth, detailed look at everything. I alluded to this at the beginning of the episode, this is probably going to be some of my best work as a, as a work, as a body of work. The research I, that went into all these episodes was pretty massive. It took me about a month and a half, almost two months to research and write all the scripts and then finally record them. All right. I hope you got value from this episode. I'll tackle each method more in depth and how that affects the winemaking. I just wanted a separate episode to give people a better idea as to how wine grapes are grown. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe and then tell your friends until next time.